Hello and welcome to the first official episode of Where Do We Begin? We've got former Essen superstar, 133 games on the show today, Courtney Dempsey. I'm a bit nervous myself, but I'm pretty pumped, ready to go. My name's Harper, my co-host over here, Jackson. Hey, how are you going? I'm, I'm super ready for this one. Ready to start this one off with a bang. Let's rip into it. Okay, now we've got on the phone the great man. He's been dubbed the Mayor of Mount Isa, the Emperor of Essendon, and the Governor of Greenvale. Courtney Dempsey, how are you? I'm good, mate. How are you? Yeah, not bad, not bad. So, obviously, massive first guest up on the podcast. Um, so, we're just going to go through your life, just ask a few questions, see how we go from there, have a bit of a chat. So, first of all, how was it growing up in Mount Isa? Yeah, oh, look, I was a, um, I only lived there for... Um, early parts of my childhood. So I was only, I think, two or three and moved away to Cairns and grew up in Cairns. So, um, and then my brother and sister were born in Cairns. But, yeah, most of my um, upbringing was in Cairns in North Queensland. Am I correct in saying you started playing footy in Cairns when you were about 12? Yeah, so I was playing rugby league. Obviously, before that, because Queensland is a massive rugby league state. Yeah, of course. And, um, I loved it, and I still do love it to this day. Um, I watch it over AFL, actually, um, more so now uh, than, than I did um, back in the day. So, you know, um, growing up there playing rugby league, I loved it. And then I basically... Uh, got shown AFL. I didn't know AFL, what AFL was, um, that there was even another sport that existed and um, basically um, took a shot to it and loved it and enjoyed it. So, yeah, but, but played both sports throughout my my junior years and, you know, Saturday was rugby league and Sunday was, sun, uh, was AFL. So it was a, a jam-packed weekend, but it was a good fun weekend for myself. When did you kind of realise that you could be an AFL player get drafted? Uh, so I um, went to got, – I got a scholarship um, when I was 16 down uh, to Bris- to move down to Brisbane and school down there and uh, go to school at Brisbane Boys College um, where there were a number of other – Footballers, I think the, the Scott brothers from Brisbane Lions play, uh, went there for a couple of years. Um, I think Charlie Cameron went there a few times uh, as well for his schooling. And, um, you know, it, it was it was predominantly a rugby union school, and and the comp there, the GPS comp, I think they called it up there, was uh, um, was more um, predominantly cricket over summer and. And union over winter, but the AFL team were, was just as strong. So, um, yeah, but about then, I think when I got the scholarship was the time I sort of gave up rugby league and and um, just focused on on AFL. So you were drafted to Essendon with pick number nineteen. How was the transition moving from Cairns to the Melbourne bubble? Yeah, it was. Um, it's definitely something different. Uh, moving from Cairns to Brisbane was a massive move um, just there, but then having to find out first that um, Essendon was in in um, in Melbourne, um, that was a big shock to my, um, shock to me, and and obviously. Um, because I didn't know, I didn't know Essendon was a club. I didn't know who they were. Um, didn't know the players there. I didn't know James Hurd, Matthew Lloyd. I didn't know any of those type of players. Um, so hearing from my manager that the Essendon Football Club is in Melbourne and that I'll be moving to Melbourne was daunting but exciting at the same time because I was I was pretty. I was quite used to moving away from home, being away from Cairns, living in Brisbane, but um, just another two hours away from 
Cairns is just a bit more daunting. So did you ever go to Lions games when you were up there in Brisbane? No. Nah. No, nah, I never went to any any AFL games live. I just played the game on the weekend. I never even watched the games um, while I played. I was just played the game and watched rugby league and played rugby league more than anything, really. Never, never delved too much into AFL football, watching it, seeing how the game goes and stuff like that. I just went out and played it and had fun. So obviously moving to Melbourne is a big thing. We have a bit of an audio grab about homesickness that uh, might be a bit interesting. Well, I just have a nice big home-cooked meal of uh, cabbage stew, so that's the best feed I've ever had, and uh, I don't think anyone else can cook it but my father. So obviously, <laughs> did you miss the home cooking back uh, when you moved to Melbourne? Yes, yes I certainly did, and, um, and that still is the cabbage stew is... <laughs> Still, it still is my favourite uh, meal, and every time I go back home or every time my dad comes down, that's the first meal he and the last meal he cooks uh, every single time. So, have you learned the I recipe? Always have it ready. I know the recipe and I, I know how to cook it, but it's just not as good as. Um, it's yeah, like every, every meal that every parent. Oh, of course, cooks, of course, one of their favourites. You can't, you can't match it. So it's very hard to to replicate his his way of cooking the meal but um i do try my best it doesn't work so i just have to wait until he either comes down or i go up there <laughs> so the first afl game you would have been to would have been your debut against carlton round one oh six or round seven oh six sorry um, yeah no so he never he never actually turned up to that because it was a late call up so my debut um the night before i got called I got a phone call from Gary O'Donnell, I believe, and he told me, "Look, we're gonna, you're you're on the emergency um, list, so just bring your stuff. We're not probably not gonna play. Um, we're just gonna wait and see how the weather holds up. And if it rains, then you're playing. And if it doesn't, then you probably won't. Um, so it was just late call up. Didn't get time for my parents to even come down, fly down or anything. Uh, so, and then it was literally, because it was still raining, I think, in the warm-up. And then literally 15 to half an hour before the game started, they told, um, she comes up and tells me that I'm playing. So, um, and that's when I made my debut and it was... Yeah, my parents couldn't come down for it. So what are your memories of the game? Um, yeah, it wasn't. It was very, um, it was very quick in a sense of like, it's, it's, all I can remember is just little flashes of different events happening on on the ground, like um, different plays, the the crowd, um, me, my first touch running in and. Um, ran too far, kicked a goal, but I ran too far. Oh no! Um, which would have been first touch, first goal. One of those apparently rare, rare things. <sighs> disappointing. That happens, um, which was disappointing, but you know, um, it was it was something special because uh, running out to a crowd of was it, I think it was like seventy or sixty-five to seventy thousand that. <laughs> that game and um yeah it was it was it was was okay i just thought it was another game um just in front of a bigger crowd so yeah 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 Yeah, so obviously that first game was a loss and then um your next five games after that across the next year and 06 they were all losses as well so you didn't get a win until your third year how was that tough start yeah, um, I think it was. I I wasn't really focused on the wins. I was I was just focusing on the experience and what I can learn from it. And you know, that's the the only way you sort of go into to games in any games really is what you learn from the last one. And if you've um, if you've ex- um, picked up on anything and 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 learned more. So if if you yeah, I, I just thought that I needed to better myself in certain areas, and I, I tried to do that. And and um, with each game, tried to to 
um, better myself um, and do something better or something different that I didn't do or I did do um, in the game previous that I played. So it's just learning from my errors and, 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 and making up for it, I suppose. So obviously you mentioned Kevin Sheedy. How is it learning about his sort of significance in the game since you you wouldn't have known a lot about footy? Yeah, it was um, very, very interesting. It was he, he definitely put his heart and soul into the game and, and not only just for – just at the Essendon Football Club but the AFL game itself. So, you know, he he, he created the, the four-man bench. Um, he's done – Massive, like the the big games, the big marquee games, the the Anzac Day, the Dreamtime, the Cancer game, the you name it, every game that there is there, he's he's had a hand in it, and um, you know he's made the game bigger than what um, what any sport in Australia is. So you know that's that's probably the the best thing, and and he's definitely the pioneer of AFL football. So how is he like as a coach, like personally, man to man? Um, I mean, he was a bit whacked, obviously. Everyone knows <laughs> that he, he, you know, he, he likes to talk and, and then he goes off with the fairies talking. Um, <laughs> but his knowledge is, is second to none, you know. He, um, he will continually come up with something new, uh, every week, um, and, you sort of be mind boggled as to what made him think of that, but at, at the end or a couple of weeks later, you sort of go, "Well, hang on, he is uh, he's probably be, uh, um, probably a little bit right there." So, you know, his philosophies and, and the way he learns um, our teachers, players, and, and and the way the game is, he's yeah, he was definitely ahead of the head of the time, ahead of head of his time um, coaching, but. Uh, yeah, you know, obviously at the end of his reigns is when I started, so um, it would have been good to be a part of his earlier uh, successes, I suppose, and and tapping into his brains back then. Yeah, so as a man, he obviously didn't necessarily stick to all of society's norms, but as a coach, what did your other coaches feel like compared to him? Um. I think the thing I I got from him was the fact that he he sort of he he cared for you as a person and and that's where I found Hurdy was probably my my best coach that I've ever had because he he cared for you as a person not as a footballer so you weren't just a necessity to him you was um family if that makes sense um he really cared for you in general cared for your family um worried about what what's going on at home how's everything at home um how i'm feeling in general not so much about football about my body how my body's feeling and stuff like that there is just everything else and and you know showing that respect to to me made me give that respect back and um, it shone, I suppose, in in the way I played uh, footy under those guys. Yeah, you always really expressed yourself as a player, you could really tell. But just fast-forwarding a few years to round 11, 2012, you might remember this one. Bombers were 47 points down against Sydney at three-quarter time. We got nine goals. I'm a Bombers fan, obviously. We got nine goals in the last quarter to get within four points. And I'll just throw over to BT from here. <laughs> they have to be perfect now. Nine seconds. Myers is going to have to rely on a mark. It'll be a mark. Dempsey's going to mark it. Siren will sound. He's oh, played it on. on. Umpire's oh, called no. play on. The umpire has called play on. Margaret says, sorry, you played on. And the Bombers would have had a kick after the siren. So what are your memories of that? Yeah, um, I didn't think it was play on, but, you know, I took a step to kick. Um, 
and heard the sirens, so I stopped. But obviously, they call it a play on, if, even if you don't run off the mark. But um, uh, I seen Nathan Love and Murray in the goal square, le- or leading back into the goal square. So I thought if I put it up nice, he would have a sit and, and, and sort of mark it. And he was dominant in that in that last quarter, kicking two of I think two of our our goals in the last quarter to get us up uh, in in front or close to being in front. So I thought I'd try and kick it in there quickly and and, and get it to him. Um, but, yeah, obviously the siren went and, yeah, a bit devastating, but that's, that's the nature of the game. Yeah, I remember I was pretty dirty after the next day with the umpire after that one was – Pretty sad. Uh, but shocker. Yeah. <laughs> I was more di- I was more dirty after the after that game watching other players that when when they took a step to kick they'd call it back and he could and they had a shot on it and I was like man you could have given me a shot out at um, on the last one. Yeah, definitely hard on so, you. Yeah, yeah, it was very hard, but uh, oh well. Uh, changing changing up a bit, like uh, going back a few years, you're obviously part of that Zaharakis. Go after the siren. How was that? Ah, uh, yeah, that uh, Anzac Day, um, Anzac Day game, the 09 Anzac Day. Is that the the goal? Yeah, that one. Yeah, Jackson's a Collingwood yeah. fan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were. Um, but I mean, I don't, I don't see why he's getting all the credit because I think the person that got it, got us in that situation was Andrew Lovett. The way he came off the halfback, the way he attacked the game in that last quarter, especially the last five, ten minutes, um, was, I don't know, he just tore it apart and made made Collingwood look like they were standing still and um, just opened them up. And that's how we came back and and got into that position for, for Zaka to actually kick the goal. But, yeah, you know, it was on a big stage and everyone gets remembered for those things and yeah it was, it was um, nothing special it was good because you know we were down um, one player with David Hill come, going down early in the game yeah right at the start uh, with the ACL from a ball that I actually kicked to him so um, he landed awkwardly when he got the ball and um, he dropped the mark <laughs> from that because he obviously hurt his knee but um yeah, coming back and, and winning that was, was special and in, in front of a big crowd too, especially when we were under the pump. Yeah, I remember the second last goal, I think it was, Ricky Dyson from the boundary. Yeah. That's not talked about too much. Yeah, no, nah, it wasn't. I reckon that was probably the best, the hardest kick of the game, that one there from the boundary, 50 out. 50 out, yeah. And it just went straight through the middle and, um, yeah, it was one, one of the greatest kicks I've seen from, especially that late in the game tired legs and uh, fatigue and wet it was raining so ball sticky and all, all slippery like it was just all over the place the, the, the way the weather was then so but yeah it was it was an unreal game so yeah talking about that that game as Harper's an Essendon fan I'm a Collingwood fan obviously it's one of the biggest games of the year for us fans how does is Anzac Day as special as it seems as a player yeah, we. Um, I'm not back then. I suppose it is. It always will be. Us, um, if you know, taking into consideration the the whole um, point around the game and stuff like that, there and the significance of the day itself. Um, and you know, if if players start to look away from the significance behind the day, then obviously it loses its value in the game. But hopefully the players nowadays don't. And, you know, we, we used to go through, we used to do the, the shrine, go to the shrine of remembrance and, 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 you know, do all that sort of stuff prior to the game and um, get that, that Anzac feeling or that, um, that, feel of of you know people before us and what they've laid down for us and the foundation that we're standing on right now is is the foundation that they've laid for us so in those 
couple of years after that Sydney game, just going back to that, uh, you probably fair to say you had a couple of disciplinary issues. You were banished to the VFL in May 2013 and then again in April 2014 for, uh, I guess, not really having the right mentality. Uh, and we have a little interview of you on the hangar that we might just throw to quickly. I was stressing over what, what, I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do. Got to a stage where, at the time, I didn't know whether I wanted to play football anymore. Well, I think at the start he was basically like really surprised and maybe a little bit angry that it happened because he thought he probably had not that much different than what he did all the other years. And the problem is that what he's been doing all the other years is not right. So that was Bomber Thompson at the end there. Um, how close were you to just quitting the game and what made you change your mind in the end? Um, uh, a couple of mates and, and, and obviously the family um, helped me get over it. But at the same time, I sort of – I still sort of – didn't want to play. I, I felt after a while the fun out of it, the fun sort of came out of the game, um, especially after the, the 2013 and what went down in 2013 and, and 14. I was just, I was, I was, yeah. What well, it just came as a as a task, as, as, as a, um, you know, I've got to get up and do this. I've got to get up and do that. It just wasn't fun anymore. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, it was very hard. It was a, a, a collective. Uh, obviously, my, my parents were the main um, driver behind keeping me in the game for a, a few more years after that. But, yeah, it was, it was a tough it was a tough time for me mentally. And, um, yeah, it was, it was very hard. So the leadership group suspended you for a month, but then when you came back, I think you played every game for the rest of the season. So would you say you're proud of that kind of mentality shift that you had? Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't sort of a shift for... Um, for them, it was more. I was, I was, I was going to prove them wrong, and you know, throughout those those years, I, you know, played probably my best footy, um, trying to prove my own teammates wrong that they were wrong about me, and that they were they were picking out pathetic shit, <laughs> um, to say the least, and. And I was I just had enough and I was wanting to prove them wrong. I was even on the verge of, of leaving the footy club and playing elsewhere. Um, especially finding out that uh, Paddy was gonna leave as well. Did you speak to any other clubs? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I spoke with um, a number of clubs. Um, so they were in, on the cards as well. So yeah. And then the next year in twenty fifteen uh, one of the last games of the season, you were suspended for a dangerous tackle on Brett Deledio, but then, kind of more importantly, you copped a bit of racial abuse via Instagram. Uh, you really spoke out about that, so that was good to see. So what what was your thinking? Yeah, look, uh, it was just... It's not tolerated. I mean, we, we've been fighting since, you know, Nicky Rimmar and... Um, Michael Long stood up against racism when they were playing. That was over ten years ago now, and um, you know we we yeah we, we look at um, all these sort of stuff that happens like this, this derogatory. Um, well, obviously, being in like having social media doesn't help either because people can hide it. A lot more easy, easily um, than than before when they have to actually confront you and call you names. But you know, um, for it to continue to this day is is pathetic, and and obviously it, it's it's clearly the education and stuff that's going through not only the schools but inside the households are not are not working and and um, it's non-existent. But I, I hate it and I don't like it um, being done at any level. Um, 
So and to anybody, um, and I stand up for it regardless, um, regardless of of what they what they've done or or anything, because that's not that's not acceptable and and it never should be. So, how did the rise of social media affect you in your career over the course of your career? Um, yeah, it was. It was uh, very tough. Um, we had to really watch what we posted, what we were doing. Um, oh, excuse me. Not not only not only for um, ourselves, but you know, a lot of us had families, so it was for the safety of our families. Um, our kids, you know, little kids and stuff like that there that we, a lot of us um, players had. Um, so, you know, it was it was very touch and go. We were still learning. It was a new thing for everybody and it was very hard um, to cope with the, the social media. And, uh, you know, as it got stronger social media-wise, um, the... The drug saga started, and that's when we really had to watch what we were doing. Yeah, so obviously, uh, in your time in Essendon, the drug scandal happened. How did it affect you personally? Um, yeah, it was very tough. Look, uh, I was in amongst every bit of it, so... Um, it it was it was very tough, very very tough, and with the the the, the way we got treated was pathetic and should never have happened because you know the, I thought the the system goes that you're innocent until proven guilty, but we're guilty until proven innocent. It was it was ridiculous and how, how the way the whole thing played out, and they just felt it just to us it felt like they were just looking for a big scape. And they got one, and it was, and it happened to ruin a lot of players' careers. So, just back to the social media quickly. Uh, again, in 2016, in July 2016, you had a fan having a go at you. He said, "You can't even provide a contest, and you want another contract. Give it a rest." And then you bit back at that on Twitter. Uh, did was the club okay with that? Uh, yes and no. I mean, some of some of the coaches were were like, "Oh, look, it's probably best you don't do it," but it was it was it was called for. Like you, you know, a lot of a lot of the coaches were old school coaches at the time, and and they 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 sort of don't cop that crap either, especially when people people like us work our asses off and um, and the people that are criticising our game and the way we play are the ones sitting down on the couch that has done nothing in their life um, but criticise players and, and how they should play. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was just like, I had enough. Like, there was a few. There wasn't only that one person at that one time. There was a few prior to that in, in a number of years but I was like no I'm, I'm, I've had enough I'm gonna call them out on it and I've got every right to call them out on it but For sure you know it just brings un- unwanted attention to the football club and myself so um, basically uh, nipped it in the butt there and then and and just forgot about it so yeah. So getting back to the sort of the aftermath of the drug saga, that last year of your career, the 2016 one where everyone sort of, everyone was suspended for a year. How did, how was that um, seeing as you've been at the club for so long, getting all these new players, how was that experience? Yeah, it was, it was tough. Um, and I, that's where I felt I, I lost, lost not only interest, but I knew my career was over. I still felt I got I, I I could give more, but I just wasn't used to playing with players that we made up in the month or not even that three weeks that we had. 
um, uh, to make a team before we even played practice matches. So yeah, it was it was tough to to get along with that. But yeah, I, I wasn't used to them playing with with players I don't even know um, that I've only ever played against. And um, yeah, it was, it was very hard. Yeah, so as you said, it was your last year in footy. I uh, ended up getting delisted. When and how did uh, Warsfold or whoever tell you? Yeah, it was just it was the last day of of trading of of the trade window where I could pick wherever I want to go to play uh, to try out, and they told me um, that I wasn't wanted last minute. And, that didn't give me a chance to go and look elsewhere. So, you know, it was disappointing, but yeah. And um, I suppose, yeah, that's part of the game, I, I guess. So you ended up playing 133 games in total for Essendon. Got your number on the locker. Uh, who are some other number 15s that are on that locker? And do you know anything about them? Um, I think there was the um, going back. Alan Izzard, I think, was the the name before me. He's obviously the eighty five or eighty four and eighty five Premiership yep. player. Um, but and then obviously back in the days, I think there was Buttsworth. I think there was only about six six names on on that on that locker. So was um, very excited and, and, and proud and privileged to, to have my name on a, on a locker that doesn't have a lot of names on there anyways. And, and um, yeah, looking forward to obviously the future and, and hopefully my sons um, to play. So lightening up the mood a bit, uh, well, well, we're going to talk about the highlights of your career now. We do have an audio grab of one of your major highlights. Dempsey, how bold was that? Look at him charging through. He lost it. He kept on going. He got next down. He got up again. He's still going, Dempsey. A little back heel. What happened? Watch the heel. Clip. Oh, you're Over kidding. The top. Look at Straight that. back to it. Didn't break stride. <laughs> That's magical. So obviously the um, AFL has been getting a lot of attention from American sportscaster Pat McAfee and York. Your clip has been on every broadcast he's made about the AFL. So, how does that make you feel? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I haven't seen, I don't follow that Pat um, very closely, but yeah, I've, I've been tagged in a few of those um, those posts, and yeah, I, you know, it is <laughs> just yeah. What what can I say? There's not not much I can say really about it. It's just something that happened in the game that was just magical and 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 um it happened to be recorded which was probably um the best thing about it so now, around four years to come yeah if you haven't seen it look up courtney dempsey back heel versus gold coast definitely worth watch so um what were some other big moments in your career that you just remember vividly yeah um obviously playing um my debut obviously is the probably the biggest um but big games playing in big games like the anzac day dream time at the g um clash for cancer uh and 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 my hundredth game would have been the the, the massive highlight as against well. the doggies was it um, yes against the doggies and Jake Carlisle kicked eight goals three um, that game, and we went away with a win. And um, yeah, it was something special. And and yeah, can't um, remember. Yeah, can cannot forget anything from that game. It was, it was, it was awesome. So obviously, being an Indigenous player, how does the uh, dream time at the G game make you feel? Um, yeah, look, it's it's. It's special. It, 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 you know, we run out there and, and, and like the uh, Anzac Day type game, this game for all Indigenous players is 
is what we're playing for is the, is the the also the foundation that the the past indigenous players paved for us in the game as well as um, our communities um, our family um, back from where we come from so you know it that game is is massive for us as indigenous people um, and we've always we always lifted for those games and um, and enjoyed every minute of of running out there on the MCG against Richmond on Dreamtime at the G game. You never won a final, disappointingly. You played in a couple, I think. Well, have you got any other regrets from your career? Um, yeah, look, there, there, there would be some regrets thinking um, here and there, like, oh, what if, what if, or oh, should have done this, or should have done that. But look, um, going back and, 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 and looking over my career, I don't see a lot of other young kids doing what I what I did so I'm, I'm happy with with what I did um, and and the way I I um, made a career uh, so you know all I need all I do now is, is trying to help the, the, the younger generation and, and trying to get them successful or, or on the right path to success and, and helping them out in whatever field that is it's not necessarily uh, always football that I that I focus in on. It's it could be anything. Education, um, education is definitely the biggest biggest thing. But uh, yeah, it's whatever their their uh, skills or uh, skill sets are in and and what they what they enjoy. So I'm looking at doing that. So you've been out of the AFL system for a few years now. Um, do you go back to the club at all? And what do you make of the current crop of the Bombers? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, three three years, four years now. Um, probably don't count twenty twenty at this moment because there's no year at all that's <laughs> happening. But you know, um, yeah, I I I go back only to help out with the long walk. Um, I do a lot of long walk stuff, and, and I'm one of the ambassadors for the long walk. So um, doing uh, little long walks around, obviously. Um, talking at schools about the long walk, uh, doing programs within schools um, about learning about what why Michael Long walked, about the history of the Indigenous culture, and and um, you know, delve a little bit into stolen generation stuff like that there, and, and um, sort of educating. Like I said before, just educating the the, the younger generation. Um, but now the the crop uh, this I'm not I'm not too sure. I think a lot of a lot of players a lot of players these days, whether it is even Essendon or any other club, once the club starts to galvanise and actually play for each other and not focus in on how many touches or how many goals they kick. You'll soon find that the team that does that will be at the top. And you look at the team that does that, which is Richmond Football Club. They they don't yep. care about the touches. They don't care about how many goals. They just care about Richmond kicking the goals and Richmond getting the football. So there's play no real other. talk. And they do. They play for each other. And, and that's how Geelong was when they were um, – up there as well as Hawthorne when they were up there. They didn't care who got the ball or who um, kicked the goals. It was just a matter of Hawthorne with the with the goal next to their name um, and the Hawthorne jersey with the football. So um, once they start getting around that, then they'll probably, well, hopefully, they will start to come together and play some good footy and some consistently good footy. Yeah, hope so. Um Obviously, you mentioned the long walk. You've uh, worked with a few other charities, Ladder, Racism It Stops With Me. How did you get into that stuff? Yeah, Ladder was just uh, because Mark Bolton obviously was the start. He started it and um, and I obviously played alongside him and, and I was looking for some um, work experience and some work over the time and yeah, I went went and checked it out and worked there for a month or so, and um, 
Yeah, it was interesting what he was doing with the homeless and, and helping out um, with that side of things. Uh, that The racism stops with me was just a, a campaign more so that I was part of because of what happened to me on over the social media and, and the way I stood up for it. So um, it was just a campaign that I that I did and, and enjoyed that as well. And it's, it's sort of the things that I, I, I stand for and what I, what I enjoy doing. Straight after you came out of the game, uh, you had a bit of a struggle with your mental health. Yeah, you told Four Corners that you feel bitter uh, and your family urged you to seek help for depression, I think. So how did you come out of that strongly? Um. Yeah, it, it's tough. That that's still hard to, to to talk about your mental health. It's very hard, especially in a in a world where we're playing uh, contact sport and we're supposed to be uh, invincible on the field and we're supposed to not feel all this stuff. It's very hard when when you talk about it and then you get shot down by the wider community saying that oh we're just soft or. Oh, you play a um, you play a contact sport. You should be used to it, sort of thing. It's it's very it, it's very heart, heart disheartening to to have to battle with that as well. So you know, people people say say things and 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 think about and don't think about the repercussions that could, could possibly happen. And, you know, this with every everything. Um, that happens not only just in the football world, but it, it also happens in in normal society where you you, you um, talking down to somebody could really bring someone right down. Um, so yeah, the brain is one of the strongest, but can also be one of the weakest muscles in the in the, in the human body. And you know, um, if you don't train it right and, and you don't have the help, and you could spiral downwards and um don't know where that will will take you so yeah it, it, it was very hard and I, I don't know i'm not too sure if i'm even still over it or not um you know i get i get a lot of um a lot of times my parents and that will tell me that there's something wrong but yeah <laughs> you know it's just the, the nature of the beast i suppose so with sort of the mental health side of the game, um, was the club helping you at all like during your career or do you think they're just starting to get around to helping the players with that sort of thing? I think they're just starting to get around to helping those things too because also I believe um, the, scrutinies, the scrutiny that each player gets is in their face a lot more. Um, Due to social media, um, the news, just you know, the the inner sanctum type uh, um, feel that that supporters want all the time of the players, forgetting that they're just human beings working their asses off to be who they are. Um, it, it's very hard than probably back in the days when you know the the scrutiny or the yeah the scrutiny wasn't on them as as frequently as as it is today and as easy as it is today like people can just jump on social media on your page and just write something about you and and, and um you know reading that is is takes a toll on, on a lot of players and yeah some players sometimes have the strength to block it out and just go out and play footy, then if you continually get it, um, it starts playing in the back of your mind. Post AFL career, um, in twenty seventeen you started playing for Greenvale under Paul Chapman, your old teammate. Uh, how did you get into how did you get into that and what was that like? Yeah, um, I, I live out in Greenvale anyway, so that was it, it was pretty easy pretty easy um yes and no answer basically um i didn't want to travel too far um and i wanted to play in a in a pretty successful team and 
and Greenvale was one of those successful teams um, within the EDFL, you know, um, uh, being one of the um, massive massive teams in the EDFL behind Aberfeldy and, and Keelor. So, um he, he, I think, no, I think it was Bruce that rang me, the, the president of Greenville rang me up and and told me and um, and asked me to come along. And, and I obviously knew a few players there with Adam Arick playing um, when he used to play at Melbourne and Richmond. Um, I used to play on him in Richmond games or Melbourne games. And also uh, Jacob Thompson, who is the nephew of Bomber Thompson. He used to play out um, the reserves team, so Essendon Reserves, Bendigo Bombers back in the days, as well as I think a bit of a few Essendon VFL side uh, games when we transferred to Essendon. But um, that was pretty easy then when I when I knew that he was there and, and Chappie was there. So, yeah, obviously you've got the EDFL. What other stuff have you got going on post-AFL? Um, I was working, um, doing a, a project officer at a health service running programs for young Indigenous kids in the Hugh Morland area and just uh, gone on about uh, respectful relationships, gender equity, uh, and and connection to culture. So, teaching the kids about the the importance of of the gender equity, the importance of how relationships, how good relationships are, and and not not just um, you know platonic relationships as well. You know, so so not just talking about um, just the the norms boyfriend and girlfriend or girlfriend and girlfriend type stuff. We're talking about friendships. We're talking about family, family um, relationships, all of that sort of stuff we, we delved into um, and, and what it looks like to – and what's acceptable in society nowadays. So teaching the young kids that, and, yeah, it was, it was good fun and I enjoyed it. And, um, but, yeah, it was, it was fun. So just to lighten up the mood uh, near the end of the podcast, we have a bit of a quiz. So you'll be going up against Harper and a few five questions. All right. So uh, your name is your buzzer. So it's a bit, it's, it's five questions about your career. So um, right. <laughs> number one, number one, uh, you were taking pick number 19 in the 2005 AFL draft. Who was number one? Mark Murphy. Got it. Oh no! Right on it, Harper. I was trying. He, I told him the question before the podcast, and he couldn't answer it for the life of him. Um, Dale Thomas was number two. Yeah, priority pick. <laughs> so, um, number two, your career high twenty eight disposals came against which side? Adelaide. Wrong. Uh, Harper. Gold Coast. Wrong. Richmond. Richmond. Oh. It. Uh, I think it was two thousand. Uh, nine, I'm pretty sure what I read. Oh. Um, so you you had five hitouts in your career against four different teams. Can you name three of them? Hitouts. Okay, Harper, I'll just buzz in now. Harper's I'll in. Go Collingwood. That's one. Port Adelaide. Wrong. And Brisbane. Wrong. Courtney. Um, so Collingwood was one of them. So yeah, Harper gets one point. Um, I think. I'm trying to think. Uh, I think Adelaide was one, and maybe Melbourne. I think both wrong. So oh, I'll just no, tell the answer. So you got two hitouts against Collingwood in two separate games. One against Richmond, one against GWS, and one against St Kilda. So question four, how many times did you play against the Gold Coast Suns? Harper. Harper? I'll go with four. Wrong. Courtney? Three. three. Ah, bang on the money. That's the that's, uh, second point for you. <laughs> so last question, Where, which stadium was your first win played in? Harper. Harper, 
go. I was reading about this before. SCG. Wrong. Courtney. Uh, I think it was uh, Eddie had. Well, bang on the money. There you go. Toast Dome. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who was it against. I think it was like St Kilda, maybe. Uh, I was the Ruse. Oh, Ruse. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, first first win at Eddie had Stadium against the Ruse. All right. Uh, I think crazy. that's it for the quiz. Courtney yep. got up. Was it three one? Three one. Three one. Good stuff, one. Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Big win there. Just. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I thought it was closer than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, anyway, I think that just about wraps us up. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Been really generous with your time. No worries, mate. No worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, been great to have you on. Yeah. Nah, not a problem. See you, mate. Have a good one. No worries. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Cheers. And how good was that? First cab off the rank with Courtney Dempsey. Uh, thank you again to Courtney for coming on. Exhilarating that. It was for a first interview. It was, he was just such a caring, lovely guy to talk to. Really generous with his time. Just perfect. Right? Yeah. I must admit, I didn't know much bef- about him before the podcast, but it was great to learn about him, talk about what he's so passionate about. Um, yeah. Great to have a chat with him. And make sure, whether or not you like the show, if you hate it, still recommend it to your mates. Get him to give it a listen. Give it a five-star review. Uh, Tune in next time for a great interview we'll have for you guys. Have a good one. See ya.